Welcome back to this series on designing your own microcontroller based PCB in Altium Designer. In the previous and first video, we looked at the board we're going to be making, kind of a block diagram overview, and selected the main components we'll be using, such as the microcontroller, buck converter for power, giving us a 3.3 volt rail and inertial measurement unit, as well as our USB C connector, which we'll be using for data transfer as well as for powering the device. In this video, we're now ready to start with our schematic in Altium Designer, creating a project from scratch, doing our initial project layout, and then starting to add components and then wiring things up in the schematic. I'd strongly suggest that you follow along in real time. And to help you do that, make sure to check out the link in the description below to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial. Let's get started. For the sake of time, I won't be showing you how to make your own footprints or schematic symbols in this video. I do, however, have a couple of videos covering these topics. One, for example, on the Altium Academy YouTube channel. If you go to the video titled PCB Footprint Creation Made Easy, this shows you how to use the very useful IPC compliant footprint wizard. To show you how to make symbol and footprints in Altium Designer, I recommend going to my own channel, which is Phil's Lab on YouTube and checking out video number 31. And that details the whole process of creating your own libraries as well as schematic symbols and footprints. In either case, if you don't want to make your own libraries, I do have my own personal set of libraries, which I've made public on GitHub. If you go to github.com, navigate to my profile, PMS67, and then navigate to Altium Designer-Libraries, you can find my footprint library as well as any schematic library. I'll be using these in the videos, as well as using the manufacturer part search functions in Altium Designer as well. We're now ready to fire up Altium Designer and get started creating our project. I now have Altium Designer open. On the top right, we can see I've connected to my cloud workspace, and this is typically the way I would work. You can of course store your projects locally, but thanks to Altium Designer, we can also store our projects with version control in the cloud, and we'll be making use of this functionality. In any case, go to the top left of Altium Designer, click File, New, and Project. Then we can choose where we want to store this project in the cloud in our workspace, simply using version control, or just a local project. I'm going to choose to store mine in the cloud because then we can push changes to our version control whenever we've finished a significant section of our design, for example, a schematic page, the whole schematic, and so on. So I'm going to click on my workspace and give my project a name. You can add a description if you want, but make sure to check version control if you'd like to have version control. We can also expand this parameters tab here and add different parameters such as version number and so on, but we'll leave this blank for now. Then click on the button create. Once the project has been created, we can go to the projects panel, which is on this left side here, scroll to the bottom, and I'll just move my camera out of the way. And you can see we have AD underscore SM32 tutorial added as this project PCB file. We can also see we have no documents added at the moment, so we have to fix that. We have to add schematic pages, we have to add a PCB document, as well as our libraries. We can right click on the project and then click add new to project and we have these options here. So we have schematic, PCB and many other options as well. Let's start off by adding all the necessary schematic files. Now this project is simple enough that we could add this all on one schematic page, but I'd like to show you how to organize a schematic into multiple pages and then link them up using a hierarchical sheet. So we're going to add multiple schematic pages, one for an overview, one for the power section, one for microcontroller, and one for the peripherals. So click on add schematic, which adds this empty schematic page, control S on your keyboard to save, and that brings up the save functionality. I will just call this zero underscore AD SM32 dash overview. We'll see in a bit why I've added an initial zero. So just click save, right click again on the project, add new to project schematic, Creates another schematic sheet, control S to save, and then one underscore ADSM32 dash power, enter to save, and then we do the same thing for microcontroller and peripheral, and that's pretty much it. We can now, so we have four schematic pages on the bottom left. We have overview, power, microcontroller, and peripherals, and this sorted in this order. This order will be important when we come to annotation later. We also need to add a PCB document where we'll do our PCB layout and routing later. So right click, add new to project PCB. Then control S and I'll just call this ADSM32 PCB and click enter to save. Lastly, we have to add our libraries and we won't add new libraries unless you'd like to make, of course, your own libraries and populate them with components. I'll be adding my existing libraries. It's really easy to do that. Right click again on the project, add existing to project, then navigate to wherever you have your footprint and schematic libraries and we can select both of them by shift or control clicking. And then click open to add them to our project. Then we can see on the bottom left, we have a new folder with libraries where we have PCB libraries and schematic libraries. 
course, you can add multiple different libraries of different sources. You can also use libraries stored in the cloud and so on. For our purposes, this is completely fine. And now we've completed our basic structure of our project and we're ready to move on to creating the schematic. The reason for the multiple schematic pages is that from our block diagram, we've already sectioned up our design into several parts. We have the USB-C and power section essentially, we have the microcontroller and we have this inertial measurement section as well. This is then reflected in the schematic by the power section, which we can place the USB-C connector under as well, with a microcontroller in the peripheral, which is then the inertial measurement unit, and we might add some sort of I.O. connectors as well. The overview page will do last, which then ties together the microcontroller, power, and peripheral sections. And then of course we have our main PCB document. So in this video we're going to start off with the buck regulator. Buck regulator or buck converter was this LTC3405 and in the first video we looked at this and this is this part here and quite nicely we can also look at the datasheet, the datasheet for this device. In a proper or more formal design of course you should do a proper power budget that is looking at the devices you'll be using and connecting what voltages you need and then what currents you need and thus what the buck converter needs to deliver. In our case, we're just going to do a bit of guesswork. The microcontroller itself will be on the order of tens of milliamps, maybe even up to 100 in certain cases, even though for this low power microcontroller, probably not. But we might have peripherals we need to attach. So that is the natural measurement unit we chose in the first video, as well as anything connected, for example, to an I.O. connector. This decision will then influence the sizing of the power section, including inductors, capacitors, and so on. We'll follow the calculations and equations given in these data sheets. I'm going to skim through the equations fairly quickly, but we will calculate them together. If you'd like to get a more in-depth understanding of why we need these equations and where these come from, I strongly suggest going to my personal YouTube channel, Phil's Lab, looking at video number 71, which is titled Switching Regulator Component Selection and Sizing, which goes into far greater detail. In addition, if you'd like to understand switching regulator theory a tiny bit more and also look at the PCB design aspect, again, which we're coming back to in this series, please make sure to check out video number 60 again on the Phil's Lab YouTube channel. The switching regulator IC we chose contains the switching element, which is this MOSFET transistor, as well as this diode. What we need to size are the input capacitors, output capacitors, the inductor, as well as this feedback network. Let's start off with this inductor L. Before we size the external components, let's add the main switching regulator IC to our schematic. I don't actually happen to have this particular part in my component library, nor have I found it using the manufacturer part search. So we'll quickly create the schematic symbol in Altium Designer and then link it with an existing footprint. The way to do that is go to your schematic symbol library, I've selected it up here, then go to the top tools and then click on symbol wizard. You could also use new component, but symbol wizard makes it a bit easier. Then we have to type in the number of pins and the display names, designators, and so on. This information you can get from the data sheet. If we scroll down a bit, looking at the package information, we have pins one to six. This is a SOT 23-6 package, and I'm simply gonna copy over designator, pin name, and that's it. A bit further down in the data sheet, we can also look at the pin functions. We have a run pin, which is essentially an enable signal. We have our ground pin, pin two, our switch node pin, which connects to the inductor, pin three, our voltage input pin, which needs to be bypassed with a decoupling capacitor. Then we have our feedback node, pin five, and a mode pin, pin six, which is a mode select input, where we can select between two different buck converter modes, pulse skipping or burst mode operation. So let's transfer this information over. I've already selected the number of pins being six. Layout style will change manually in a second. Then we have these display names, and I've already typed them in, run, ground, switch, and so on but we also have to change the electrical type. Run was our enable signal, so that's an input. Ground is a power connection. Switch is a power connection. V in is a power connection. V feedback is our feedback voltage input. And mode is also an input, although it's okay to dub this a passive pin. So I'll just select passive because it strictly speaking isn't an input. It's more of a strapping pin. Then I can go to the bottom and click place, new symbol, and we have all of our pins put down like this. But of course, this is not how we should leave the schematic symbol. First of all, on the right side, on the properties panel, we can see design item ID, designate and comment, and we should fill these in. Design item and comment, I typically leave the same, and that's just the part number. Designator, I'll select U question mark, U as it's an IC, and question mark, and this will be filled in when we annotate or give numbers to these parts later on in the schematic. 
For the description, I typically just copy over what's in the data sheet. For example, the top here, just for simplicity, I'll do that. And then we have these various parameters on the right side in the middle. What I like to do is add two parameters. So click add parameter and then add parameter again. I'll add a manufacturer and I'll add a manufacturer part number parameter. And this is useful because when we come to ex exporting our bill of materials, we can automatically export manufacturer and the manufacturer part number. Manufacturer part number is simply the name of the device and manufacturer is analog devices. We also need to link a footprint and you can see there's no footprint assigned yet. And this is simply a SOT23-6 footprint. So all I have to do in the footprint is go to add footprint, click on browse, and it's already selected my footprint library. And then I can scroll down to find my SOT23-6 footprint, which I already created before. And again, please refer to the videos I mentioned near the start of this video. Then click OK, click OK again, and we've linked our symbol to our footprint. Now we have to clean our symbol up a bit. We don't want to leave our symbol like this because this will make our schematic very messy. What we want to do is arrange our symbol in a way that makes sense on the schematic, that shows design intent, that maybe helps the PCB layouter, and so on. A good starting point for this is the typical application circuit, which shows input voltage on the left, output voltage on the right, and the way these elements are arranged like so. Typically, we want our flow from left to right, the V in on the left, our switch node, which is our voltage output on the right, ground on the bottom, our voltage name on the left, our feedback on the right, and our mode on the left. I've done it this way because our input voltage comes from the left, our run or enable signal is typically tied to our input voltage, and on the right side we have a switch, which is our output, and we have our feedback, which connects after the switch, so after the inductor and after the output capacitors. So as a rough symbol, it might look something like this. Fairly neatly organized and somewhat logical, hopefully. Then we can click Control S to save our schematic symbol library, and now we actually go to our schematic. On the left side, you can double click in your project on the relevant page you want to go to, and then that opens up in this tab section at the top of an Altium Designer. To place a component, if you look on the bottom right, we can see a component section. If that isn't visible to you, just go to Panels and then click on Components. I'll go to there. Then I need to select which library I want to choose from. I go to Schematic Library, and then I'll just search for the component. And you can see here we have our design item ID and a description. I can either click and drag it in, or I can right click and click place. Then simply click on the schematic to place. I can click as many times as I want and place as many parts as I want. To cancel a command, simply right click or press escape. So now we have our main switching IC on the schematic page, and we have to add the surrounding circuitry. So now let's go back to the data sheet and try and calculate the values. So here back in the data sheet, let's scroll down and any buck converter data sheet will typically have example calculations and how to size the components. I typically like to size my inductor first, and that's the first equation or calculation I start with. The equation is given a slightly odd form in this data sheet. We have to rearrange this for the inductance on one side and everything else on the other side. Now the inductance we need or the minimum inductance we need is dependent on the switching frequency, our desired ripple current in the ductor, output voltage and input voltage. Again, referring back to one of my videos, if we rearrange the equation, we can see the minimum inductance is given as so, V out times the input output differential divided by the inductor ripple current, switching frequency and the maximum expected input voltage. So I've written down some of our system parameters here. Our output voltage is 3.3 volts. Our maximum input voltage is 5.5. Remember, USB is nominally at 5 volts, but can go as high as 5.5. So we have to assume the worst case. Our switching frequency, which we got from the data sheet and from the part, is 1.5 megahertz. And our maximum current we could expect for this part, and maybe even for our design, I've set at 300 milliamps. 300 milliamps because we might be attaching peripherals that need to be powered, maybe a radio, maybe a transceiver, something like that. If we assume a smaller maximum current, we need a larger inductor, so keep that in mind. Then our ripple current, which is our delta IL, is approximately 30 to 40% of our maximum load current. I typically choose 0.3 or 30%, and that gives me 100 milliamps as my ripple current. With all this information, I simply plug that into my formula and then get the result. Therefore, I've typed in my formula into Google because that then lets me easily calculate what I need and I've scaled it to give you a micro Henry result. So all I've done, I've just used this equation and as you copy that over, filled in our values specific to this example. And that gives me a minimum inductance of 9.78 micro Henry's. And we round that up or find the nearest standard value of inductance and that's 10 micro Henry's. So for our design, we're going to be using a 10 micro Henry inductor. 
not just the inductance value is important, it's also how much current the inductor needs to be able to handle without saturating. And this is the load current, the maximum load current, plus half the ripple current. So in our case, we assumed a ripple current of 100 milliamps. So half of that is 50 milliamps, and our load current is 300 milliamps at maximum, 300 plus 50 milliamps. So 350 milliamps at a minimum, our inductor should be rated for. And this we need when we select our inductor. So again, going back to our distributor of choice, I select my termination style for my inductor as SMD. I would want a shielded inductor, and in pretty much most cases, you want a shielded inductor. Our inductance, we want at 10 microhenries, nominal. Of course, we'll have some sort of tolerance for inductors. It can be as bad as plus minus 20%. So it maybe pays off to choose a slightly larger inductor given the tolerance. Our maximum DC current, remember, ripple current divided by two plus our maximum load current is a minimum, so 350 milliamps. The rest we can leave pretty much untouched for now. In stock, of course, then apply filters. Again, we can sort by price, and then we have quite a few different alternatives we can choose from. Just looking at the first few examples, we don't have to be too fussy. We could maybe look at this inductor, which has a maximum DC current of 450 milliamps, saturation current of almost double, certain temperature ranging, but also quite a large maximum DC resistance of 720 milliohms. So to improve your efficiency, you would typically choose a smaller resistance value. For these fairly low currents, it isn't that bad. But remember to calculate your I squared R losses and so on. The package is 2412, which is a 2.4 millimeter square package with 1.2 millimeter height, so fairly small, which seems suitable for our design. So let's just go with that one. I'll copy over the manufacturer number, and in this case, I'll be using Altium Designer's manufacturer part search. So go to Altium Designer. In the bottom right, you can see the manufacturer part search tab. Copy in the name, press enter, and we can see this little green icon next to the component lets us know this is available in the Altium content vault, so to speak, in the library vault, and we can place this directly on our schematic, and it will be linked with a suitable footprint. The so right click, place, downloads this file and we can place it on our schematic. So that's pretty neat. We don't have to create our own schematic symbol and libraries if we can find them in this manufacturer part search. So click to place, right click to cancel the command, and we've chosen our inductor. I prefer putting the actual value of inductance next to the schematic or on the schematic symbol rather than this name. So I've copied the name and just put it as a comment in Altium Designer, and I'll just change this by double clicking and typing in 10 micro to let us know this is 10 micro Henry's of inductance. Next, we have to choose input and output capacitors. For input and output capacitor selection, that can actually be quite complicated to calculate precisely or accurately. In many designs, you can get away with just using what's on the data sheet for a given voltage, for a given output voltage, given current. And that's exactly what we're gonna do for the sake of time. To learn a bit more about this, I again recommend video number 71 on the Phil's Lab YouTube channel, which goes into a bit more detail than we will in this video for the sake of time. If we go back to the data sheet, we'll find typical application schematics, either the beginning or close to the middle or end of the data sheet, and these will give recommended values for capacitances. In this example, they haven't given us the current, but they give us an input voltage range. Our output voltage is 3.3, which is the same as our system, and they're using a 4.7 microfarad ceramic capacitor output and a smaller one, 2.2 microfarads of the input. For the sake of bomb consolidation, meaning that we want to reduce the number of different or unique parts in our bill of materials and in our design, we're going to use a 4.7 microfarad at the output and a 4.7 microfarad at the input. This makes sure we only need one part for our design and we're not creating too many unique entries. So going back to Altium Designer, I actually have generic capacitors in my libraries. So I'll go and select components in the bottom right and search for cap. If I search for cap, quite a lot of entries come up. And then there's the footprint size, 0201, which is tiny, and 1210, which is rather large. I also have by default a voltage rating, which is important because the capacitance typically decreases if we apply a larger DC bias to the capacitor. My rule of thumb is that if I know I have a DC bias on my capacitor, I will choose double that as a minimum for a rating of my capacitor. If I have a five volt DC bias on my capacitor, I choose at least a 10 volt rated capacitor. Choosing a capacitor size or general passive component size is, is quite a topic for itself as well. We're just going to go for fairly easy to solder parts such as 0603 and 0805, at least for this power section. So let me choose 0805 16 volt capacitors, which gives us a nice voltage rating and a nice size to solder. I just drag one in and then double click. I'll change the value to 4.7 microfarads. And you can see I'm doing 4U7, U for micro, 
and I prefer doing 4U7 rather than 4.7 because it makes it easier to read and less prone to mistakes when missing out the dot. I can click on my component, Control C and Control V to place another one on the other side, on the right side of the inductor. Next, let's look at the feedback section of this buck converter. And this is very typical of most adjustable buck converters. We have a feedback divider, as shown in the datasheet here, which we take at the output of our buck converter, so after the inductor and after the output capacitor, adjust the voltage with our potential divider, R1 and R2, and feed that into the feedback pin of our buck converter. This buck converter IC then internally compares it with a reference and adjusts the output voltage accordingly if it's, for example, under 3.3 volts or above 3.3 volts. So it's a closed loop control system. We can set the output voltage by adjusting R1 and R2, our feedback network, and the formula is usually given in the datasheet. So our output voltage is some reference voltage, typically 0.8 volts, times 1 plus R2, the top resistor, divided by the bottom resistor, R1. Of course, we have to make sure our output voltage stays bounded between 0.8, which is the lower limit, which happens to be the reference voltage, of course, and the upper limit, which is 5.5 volts, which is our maximum input voltage. So we choose R2 and R1 to give us 3.3 volts of the output. Typically, there's also orders of magnitude information. So if R2, R1 should be in the range of kilo ohms, tens of kilo ohms, hundreds of kilo ohms, and so on. And the best way is usually to follow the manufacturer's guidelines. We're fairly lucky because our typical application circuit actually gives us a 3.3 output voltage and we have suitable resistors already shown here, which happen to be 887 kilo ohms and 280 kilo ohms. And this will give us 3.3 volts of the output. We can verify that by typing it in the top bar. Our formula was 0.8 times one plus the divider ratio and this will give us 3.33 volts output if of course our resistor values are exact. Of course, we'll have some tolerance on the resistor values, 5%, 10%, so therefore it's best to choose 1% resistor values for these resistors. You also see they've added this parallel capacitor to the top resistor, 22 picofarads, and this is for compensation. Because this is a closed loop control system, we have to deal with stability issues as well, and this compensation capacitor ensures stability for these settings. So let's copy this over into our schematic. Back in Altum Designer, let's add some resistors. So go to Components, again, select your library, and I happen to have res components, so resistors and various package sizes. We're gonna be using 0603. They're fairly small, but easy enough to still solder. So let me just drag them in, space to rotate, and then the top resistor was 887 kilo ohms, so double click, change the value and click Enter. I can copy that, Control C, Control V, and change the bottom resistor value, double click, 280K. Remember, we also need our compensation capacitor. So I'm gonna choose another capacitor, so cap, and I'm gonna choose a size of 0603 and a voltage rating of you know 10 volts or above. Let's just say 16 volts. Change that to 22 picofarads at 22P, and there we go. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was insightful into how to choose switching regulator components. In the next video of the series, we'll be looking how to then route up these components using the wire tool, as well as power ports. We'll also look at how to add a USB-C connector and how to hook up the USB-C connections, for example, communication channels, so we can sync current for our device. Thanks again for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye.